Wow, good evening, you guys. How are you this evening? Good, how are you? Good, man. Thanks for coming out this evening. I know anytime my wife says we have to go to an event like this, I turn into like a little kid that's got to go clothes shopping. You know, like, I don't want to go. Don't make me go. And my wife's like, but you're the speaker. And I'm like, yeah, it's okay. They'll find somebody else. But yeah. But I'm so thankful you guys came out tonight. So we're going to be talking about drugs and alcohol and all that kind of information. A whole different subject. Uh, but I'm glad to be in a church doing this. And so uh, my name is Ray Lozano. I do get to travel all across the nation for the Elks talking about drugs and alcohol. Uh, what you see us doing here tonight, both my daughter and I, we do about 325 times a year. So we're all across the United States. We're on the road about nine and a half months out of the year doing this. And so, yeah, just kind of giving you information on different ways to talk to your kids. But tonight we're just covering alcohol and uh, vaping because it seems to be like a big issue right now with kids and all that. So we're going to talk about that. I personally come from a non-use background. So what that means is I've never been drunk, never smoked a cigarette. Never tried weed or anything like that, but I came from a family that was crazy when it came to drugs and alcohol. Uh, one of my brothers was a drug trafficker. He brought in heroin from Mexico into the United States through uh, the Tijuana border right there in San Diego. Uh, and so he finally got busted. He's the one that changed my life because I was age five when he was 22 being busted for smuggling heroin in the United States. And the last thing they told me, or he told me before he was sent off to Terminal Island, a federal penitentiary, is he put those handcuffs around me as he was walking away and he hugged me. I'm only five, he whispered in my ear, he said, little brother, don't do drugs, man. Drugs are bad, don't do drugs. And off my 22 year old brother went to a federal penitentiary. Uh, my dad was a fighter when he got drunk. My other brother was a fighter when he got drunk. And everybody's much older than me, and so uh, whenever my dad and brother would get together and they'd start drinking, it usually ended up being a big, huge fight. Uh, one of the last things that they did is they got into this big fight in the garage, and my brother actually pulled a knife, attempted to stab my dad, and that's how bad the fight was. And my dad kicked them out of the house, said, I don't want to see you anymore. Uh, my sisters use so much meth, they can't put teeth in her mouth anymore. Have you guys heard of a term called meth mouth? Anybody heard of this term? Right, yeah, it's where you've done so much meth, they can't put teeth in your mouth anymore. Hmm. My mom was a kind of alcoholic. How many of you have seen this? And I'm always asking for a lot of audience participation. Uh, how many of you have ever seen people that drink, they get drunk, but they try to act like they're not drunk? Who's seen these people? Right, yeah, pretty much everybody. Yeah, like we're stupid, right? Like we don't know they're drunk. And that was my mom. <laughs> so I'd come home, my mom be holding a drink, walking backwards in the house. Me, though, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I'd look at her like, Mom, you're not okay. You're doing Michael Jackson right now. You're not good. <laughs> yeah. And so we knew my mom was drinking because she had all these little secret recipes like margarita meatloaf tequila tacos, you know, in the morning she's eating Corona Cheerios because they're magically delicious, you know. never brought my friends over for dinner because they'd leave with a buzz, you know. all my buddies would be like, can your mom drive us home, and I'd be like, no, look at her, man, you know. she just had a six pack of burritos, she's not going anywhere, you know, so it was crazy growing up in this house, our families turned around, I got to say, by the grace of God, that happened, once my brother went to jail, and he found the Lord there, and it just turned our whole family around, so if you were to look at our family now, it would be a whole different situation and you would be curious like really these people did that much drugs and so yeah, it's just amazing what God can do in our life so I have the opportunity to go out and teach this kind of information for all the students in the room how many of you've ever sat through those really boring drug presentations who sat through those right yeah right every time I see high school kids in those boring drug presentations they always have the same look on their face it's a look like oh, I wish I was on drugs right now to get through this thing you know and I thought this information is pretty important man let's make it fun to learn so I'm gonna do a lot of audience participation so get ready to call out stuff ask questions things like that okay good can of beer in my hand pop it open glug 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 and drink it down in a second tell me how long do you think it takes for that alcohol to go from my mouth all the way down my esophagus into my stomach large and small intestine penetrate the lining of that go into my bloodstream and finally make its way to my brain how long does that whole process take somebody throw out a number 45 minutes, good number, it's way too high, less than 45, drop it down, 30, good number, 30 minutes, drop it down, 5 minutes, good number, drop it down, 1, good number, cut it in half, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, about as long as it took us to do that is how long it takes for alcohol to go from your mouth down your esophagus, into your stomach, large and small intestine, penetrate the lining of that, go into your bloodstream, and hit your brain. Now, as soon as alcohol hits your brain, this is what your brain says. 
whoa, this is a poison, I gotta get this out of here. So your brain actually changes the way that your body's working to get that alcohol out of there. Now your body, your brain will get rid of alcohol three different ways, they all begin with the same exact letter. If somebody were to drink a whole bunch of alcohol using one of these letters up here, what is the very first way your body will get rid of it using that letter? You will? P. P. I know it's weird to call that out in church, right? Yeah. Yeah. The answer is usually yes or God, right? But yeah. So, yeah. So P is correct. If you drink a whole bunch, you will pee. If you drink way too much, you will? Puke. Puke. Correct. And if you drink way too much, you will? Pass out. Did anybody think poop right there? <laughs> I usually get one that says that. Yeah, <laughs> sicko. But anyway, okay. Pee, puke, and pass out. Now these are three things that are taking place, but they're three indicators of what's taking place inside the body. Okay? I know they're kind of funny, but they're three different indicators of what's happening inside your body because your brain thinks this is a poison and it has to get this out of here. Okay? It's got to get the alcohol out. Somebody drinks really hard on a Friday night. Saturday they wake up, light is too bright, sound is too loud. They have this crazy headache going on. They can't make a decision. They feel terrible. Ugh. Their mouth tastes like they found a dirty diaper on the side of the road and tried to eat it. Okay, yeah. I know that's gross. It's called tequila. Make sure you stay away from it. <laughs> what is that terrible feeling called? A hangover. The reason why you get a hangover whenever you drink alcohol is because you peed too much water out of your body. Now the reason why you get a headache from drinking alcohol is because what's happening is your brain is using water in your system to flush that alcohol out. Right now all of us have a thin layer of water that surrounds our brain. Whenever you drink alcohol, that thin layer of water gets evaporated because it's using it to flush it out of your body. Your brain actually shrinks a tiny amount, pulls away from the inside of the skull. That is why the whole head hurts. The reason why your mouth tastes so bad after drinking alcohol is because you don't have enough water in your system. The reason why you have trouble making a decision is because your sugar level is too low inside your body. So whenever you have a hangover, your body is really offset uh, because you have lost so much water from peeing. Puking. Once somebody starts to puke out, puke out alcohol, what the brain is saying right here is it's saying, wow, this is too much alcohol. If I don't get rid of this, I'm going to die. So what it's trying to do is get rid of as much alcohol as it possibly can because it's calculating how much alcohol is going in. The brain says, I can't deal with that much. I got to get rid of it. So puking is the second safety mechanism that you have. Um, I, I got time for this real quick. I used to work in an emergency room and I discovered the very worst food a human being can puke out. I'm going to share my wisdom with you. <laughs> kid, 19 year old kid was drinking on a bridge five feet off the ground. He was eating this food item, drinking beer, eating, drinking, eating, drinking, eating, drinking. About 11 o'clock this 19 year old kid was so drunk he fell backwards off this bridge, landed flat on cement. His friends called 911, 911 came and picked him up. They brought him to the emergency room strapped to a backboard. You guys know what a backboard is? Yeah, they had a strap around his ankles, his knees, his waist. They had his hands crossed like this. They had a strap really tight on his arms. Foam C collar on his neck. They had duct taped his head to the board. They brought him into the emergency room laying flat on his back. I'm down here by his feet. Three nurses right here. Doctor working on his spine. 19 year old kid strapped to this board looks up and he starts screaming, I'm gonna puke, I'm gonna puke. Doctor says, good, let's get that alcohol out of you. He goes, I don't want to puke. Doctor looked at him and said, why? He goes, because I'm laying on my back. Doctor said, don't worry about that. Three nurses grabbed this backboard real quick. They slid it right up to the edge of the bed, locked it in these hooks, and then they tilted the board up. But they didn't tilt it up this way. They tilted it up this way, sideways. I'm watching a 19-year-old kid getting ready to puke. This nurse lights this huge garbage can underneath him. 19-year-old kid goes, I'm going to puke. Doctor says, good, let's get that alcohol out of you. He goes, I don't want to puke. Doctor looked at him and said, why? He goes, because I've been eating. Blah. Worst thing to vomit out of your mouth and nose? <laughs> Flaming hot Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching this 19-year-old kid, man, vomit out flaming hot Cheetos and alcohol at an alarming rate. I shouldn't even tell you this part of the story, but the only thing I could think of at that moment, the only thing I could think of was, man, wish I had my phone, because <laughs> I would have videoed this whole thing, man. I would have stuck it up on YouTube, but I would have run it backwards, so you know what it would have looked like, right? <laughs> I would have called it Taste the Rainbow. <laughs>
When somebody drinks so much that they pass out, this is the brain saying, I have to stop alcohol from coming in. I can't pee it out fast enough. I can't puke it out fast enough. I have to stop this from coming in. So this is the final safety mechanism that we have inside our body that keeps us alive. Now you have to understand, passing out is different than falling asleep. If somebody falls asleep from alcohol, like they have a glass of wine and they fall asleep, and they have to pee or puke, they will wake up. If somebody drinks so much that they pass out and they have to pee or puke, they will not wake up. This is where it starts to get really dangerous. First part of your brain that's going to get affected, let me go ahead and get a drawing of my brain up here real quick. Oh man, that's a good job. That's my daughter drawing up there, so you'll meet her in a minute. This is our brain, okay? The very first part of your brain that gets affected whenever you drink alcohol is right behind the right eye right here. Let me show you where that's at. Everybody hold up your hand like this. Hold up your finger like that. Place it right above your right eye. Feel how that's kind of hard and kind of soft right there? If you were to go all the way back and touch your brain, don't do it, super painful. <laughs> I'm with one of those elementary school boys the other day, you know, that can't sit still, and I'm like, touch your brain, he's like, <laughs> got an owie, <laughs> get the nurse, right? Okay, right behind your right eye right there is the very first part of your brain that gets affected whenever you drink alcohol. What this part of your brain does, it's called the frontal lobe part of your brain. Now, for all the students, kids in this room underneath the age of 21, you're gonna disagree with this, but your parents are gonna be like, yeah, that's true. For all the kids underneath the age of 21 right now, that part of your brain isn't even working yet. It's not. You feel like it is, but it is not. For all the young ladies in the room, that front part of your brain doesn't start working until you're 21 years old. For all the guys in the room, <laughs> 23, okay? So guys, you get two extra years of being crazy, all right? 21 for young ladies, 23 for guys. Let me show you the little tiny part of your frontal lobe that is working for all the students in the room. For adults, it's all working, but for kids, um, let me show you the little tiny piece that is working. I'm gonna ask you a question. You shout an answer back at me. The answer that you're gonna shout back at me is gonna come from right behind your right eye right here, okay? No other part of the brain. Right eye is gonna make a decision. It's gonna send a signal to your muscle control part of your brain. Muscle control part of your brain is gonna make your mouth move and say a word. Watch how fast this happens, okay? Here we go, get ready. Ketchup ice cream, good or gross? Gross. gross. Anybody say good? I thought I heard one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the person that said poop earlier, but yeah, okay. <laughs> now, how many of you said gross to ketchup ice cream? Has anybody ever tasted ketchup ice cream? No. How do you know it's gross? It sounds, gross. sounds gross, exactly. Here's what happened right behind your right eye. When I said the word ketchup, right behind your right eye, it grabbed the flavor of ketchup. Then when I said the word ice cream, it grabbed whatever flavor ice cream you like, tried to stick it together, said gross, not gonna work. Here is the amazing thing about being a human being. Being a human being means that it's gonna happen in here before it happens out there. For animals, it happens out there before it happens in here. So everything that happens to a human being has to happen in their head before it's going to take place out there. The idea of the train was in somebody's head before it was a train. The airplane was in somebody's head before it was an airplane. The cell phone that you carry around was in somebody's head before it was a cell phone. This room was in somebody's head before it was an actual room. How many kids in the room already have teachers talking to you about going to college? Who has that happen already? Young lady, you guys do over there, right? Yeah. Do you know why they're doing that? If you can see yourself going to college, what do you think will happen? You'll go to college, right? Yeah, it's gotta happen in here first. So that's the little part of your brain that is working for all the kids in the room. All the students in the room, here's the big chunk of your brain that is not working. And I'm a little scared sometimes to watch all the hands that go up on this. All the kids in the room, when is the, uh, all the kids in the room, uh, when was the last, or let me ask you this, have you ever done anything that is unbelievably crazy, dangerous, or stupid with your best friend? Who's done something like that, right? Yes, <laughs> right, yeah. How many of you that crazy thing involved fire, right? Yeah, I thought so, yeah. How many of the students in the room, after you did that crazy thing, you looked at your friend all excited, and you go, we almost died, and like, you were happy about that? Right, there it is, yeah, frontal lobe not working, right, yeah. So the thing is, this is the very first part of your brain that gets affected whenever you drink alcohol. What this front part of your brain does right there, it's amazing. Human beings can do this, animals cannot. Human beings have the ability to predict the future. We do. 
You use it all the time. So this part of the brain right behind our right eye helps us to predict the future. If you had to be here at five o'clock and you had to leave your house at a certain time, it's that part of the brain that got you here. If you're gonna go to the movies on Saturday and you have to be there at two, that part of the brain got you here. So the thing is it helps you to predict the future. Kids in this room, you have trouble predicting the future or seeing around corners. But let me give you an easy one, okay? Here we go, get ready. Big huge hill goes down like this. I am standing at the top of that hill wearing tennis shoes and a bathing suit. <laughs> don't, don't picture that in your frontal lobe. Okay, yeah. Your brain had to go the beach and Chewbacca, right? Okay. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Mandalier sunscreen right here. Okay. I am at the top of this hill. Tell me what's going to happen. Left hand side over here is my very best friend. Right hand side over here is a brand new shopping cart. <laughs> right? I look at my best friend all excited. I'm like, dude, I want to ride down this hill as quickly as I possibly can. My best friend looks at me and he says, okay. Right? <laughs> so me and my little tennis shoes and bathing suit, I get in this shopping cart. My best friend grabs this shopping cart and he looks. He goes, all right, here we go, man. Get ready. One, <laughs> two, get ready, dude. Here we go. Third. I'm sorry, it's my best friend. It'll probably look more like this. <laughs> Uno, andale, right? Dos, <laughs> tres, <laughs> and he pushes that shopping cart down that hill. I go flying down that hill, 35 miles an hour. I got the wind blowing through the hair on my head and hair on my arms, and I am flying down this hill. I look up. When I look up, I got tears coming out of my eyes. Get ready. When I look up, I see that there is a garbage truck parked in the bike lane. If I don't stop my little shopping cart, I will die right or crash what you did right there is you predicted the future now all it takes to slow that part of the brain down right there is one and a half cans of beer within the course of an hour for somebody my size for students in this room it would be a whole lot less but for somebody my size one and a half cans of beer within the course of an hour and I start to lose my ability to predict the future this is why drunk drivers kill people right there and they don't even realize that they're, they're, that part of the brain is missing. I would never do this, but if I gave any of the kids in this room one and a half cans of beer, if you were 15, 16, one and a half cans of beer within the course of an hour, you'd walk straight, talk straight, carry on a normal conversation. I could walk any of you up to the top of the hill, no problem. Put you in a shopping cart, no problem. Push you down that hill, no problem. Pop something up in front of you real quick, Big problem. Understand this, the very first thing you lose when you drink alcohol is the ability to make a quick decision. A lot of times this is a good quick decision. This is why, like I said, drunk drivers kill people right there. We were at a high school not too long ago and this one kid came up to me and he goes, yeah. He says, right there, man. He says, that's why I'd rather be in the car with somebody that's stoned than somebody that's drunk. They're both impaired driving. Big huge study just came out by AAA Automotive Club and the Highway Patrol. Here's what they found out. If there's a stoplight and there's an accident on this side of the stoplight, alcohol related. <clears throat> if there's an accident on this side of the stoplight, marijuana related. And so what they found out is that a drunk driver is heading towards a light that is green, okay? And the brain says, let's go. But remember, they do not have the ability to predict the future or make a quick decision. Boom light changes yellow, but it's way too fast for the drunk driver's brain to accommodate that. Boom, light changes red, drunk driver goes through the red light, <laughs> causes an accident on that side. What they're finding out with people that smoke weed, one hour after smoking a marijuana joint, people that are smoking weed, <sighs> have a tendency to stare at stuff for long periods <laughs> of time. And so what's happening is they are staring at stuff and even though they don't feel high anymore, they still are staring at stuff for long periods of time. So what they're finding out is people that are smoking weed take their eyes off the road a whole lot more than people that are texting. So you get somebody that's high and they're driving, they're like, I'm driving a car, <laughs> high five, nobody's in the car, right? And so they're driving, but then they see something that grabs their attention and they're like, whoa, shiny thing.
thing. <laughs> Shiny thing, right? Then the munchies hit, and they're like, Burger King. Right? And they pull in a Burger King. Yeah, a dude with a crown, right? And so what they're finding out is people are causing just as many accidents when it comes to marijuana. In the state of California, that just legalized marijuana not too long ago, and they found this out in Colorado as well, is that um, in, they're saying by the end of summer this year in California, people that are high will be causing just as many accidents as drunk drivers in the state of California. Any young drivers in here? Any 15, 16 year olds, right? 15, 16, 18, 18. do you drive? Yeah. Car insurance? Yep. Yeah, any state that legalizes marijuana, uh, age 16 to 23 are the first to get hit. So what the car insurance companies immediately do within the first six months of a state legalizing marijuana is they jack up your car rates. In Colorado, they pay 40% more than they did four years ago to, because of that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, just because there's so many accidents. So the very first part of your brain that gets affected is your right eye. The next part of your brain that gets affected, everybody hold up your hand like this. Like the letter C, place it right above your ears, okay? Whenever you did this and this, this is the part of your brain that lit up. Go ahead and put your hands down. That's the part of your brain that lit up right there. So as I'm walking back and forth, this is the part of my brain that is lit up, okay? So whenever you see somebody staggering or walking funny or they're slurring their words, what that means is they've lost their ability to predict the future. They're gonna make decisions really slow. They're gonna do stuff that they would not normally do and now it's starting to affect their muscle control. I don't know if you guys ever seen cops on TV before. Ever seen the show Cops, right? They had this one police officer, he's driving his police car in Dallas, Texas, and you know how they do it. He looks in the camera and he goes, my name's Jake. He says, I've been a police officer here in Dallas, Texas, going on about 15 years. He says, I don't like being in the office. I like being out here where the action is, you know. Two o'clock in the morning, this pickup truck's weaving back and forth in traffic. Police officer Jake looks into the camera and he goes, we're obviously following a vehicle where the driver's intoxicated. I'm gonna proceed to pull this vehicle over. Puts on his red light, hits his siren, boo, gets on the microphone. Driver of the vehicle, please pull over to the side of the road. You see the pickup truck go over to the side of the road, goes up on the curb, hits a park bench and it stops. Officer looks in the camera and goes, yep, this guy's definitely intoxicated. I'm gonna proceed to pull this gentleman out of his vehicle. So he gets on the microphone and goes, driver of the pickup truck, please step out of your vehicle. This is where it started to get weird. You see the dude open up the truck door like that, looks back at the cop. When he looks back at the cop, the dude falls out of the truck. And he stands up like, I'm okay, I'm okay, you know. That police officer comes walking up to him, looks at him, says, sir, you know why I pulled you over tonight? Guy says, no. He's like, sir, you been drinking? He says, no. He says, sir, honestly, how many beers have you had tonight? This cowboy dude goes like this. He goes, I had, uh-huh, yep, uh-huh. Oh yeah, yep, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Looked at his fingers all happy, looks at the cop, he goes, ah, two, you know. The officer says, sir, he says, can I give you a field sobriety test? Guy says, yeah, go ahead, I'll pass. So what he's doing is he's checking this part of the muscle control, because once somebody cannot do a field sobriety test, they have no, they should not be driving a vehicle. So he looked at the guy and he says, sir, he says, please put your feet together where they're touching. And the guy's standing there, he's already wobbling all over the place. Sir, please put your hands out to the side. He puts his hands out to the side like that. He says, sir, please look up. Guy looks up. This is where it got really tough. He says, sir, please lift up your right foot. And the dude is doing everything he can to keep from falling over. Then the officer said, touch your nose. I don't know if this guy couldn't hear or what, but it looked like he was trying to touch the cop's nose. You know, like, I think that's your badge, you know, and reaching all over the place. Finally, the, guy had a, the officer had the guy put his hands on the hood of the car like that, starts to pat him down, hits the guy's pocket. He goes, sir, do you have a weapon in your pocket? Guy says, no. He's like, sir, what's in your pocket? Guy gets all quiet and goes, a beer. <laughs> Reaches in, pulls out a can of beer, sits it on the hood of the car. Uh, can I get a guy volunteer up here real quick? Guy volunteer, dude, oh, I was hoping you'd volunteer. Let's give this young man a round of applause as he makes his way up here. I love volunteers because they never know what they're volunteering for, so yeah. <laughs> Let me have you take that tape and walk down that way yep. just a little ways. Not too fast, a little bit more. Right there, good. All right. What's your name? BK. BK? Yep. Okay, all right. BK, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a field sobriety test, okay? Awesome. So you're going to start right there, and what you're going to do is you're going to walk all the way to this end right here, but you're going to have your hands at your side, 
Every time you take a step, I want you to do this thing called heel toe, heel toe, where your heel touches your toe like that. When you get to the end right there, turn right around and walk right back, okay? And it's BK, the initials BK, right? Yep. Okay, good. All right, good job. Nice. Great. Go and turn around, look up at me while you're walking. Yep. Good. Good job, man. You're doing fantastic. That's good. Nice. High five right there. Round of applause right here, everybody. Yeah. Hold on, don't go anywhere yet. Yep. All right. I don't know if you've ever seen these before or not. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I don't know if you guys have ever seen these before or not. Who's seen Fatal Vision goggles before? A couple of you? Okay. What these represent is somebody that has been drinking. This right here is 0.17. What 0.17 would be for somebody my size is about five beers in about two hours. This isn't crazy drinking. This is about a beer every half hour right in there. Uh, when I worked in the emergency room, we had people that would come in. Sometimes they were handcuffed in car from car accidents and stuff. And we'd ask them, how many beers have you had tonight? They'd look and they'd go, oh man, two, maybe three at the most. But we checked their blood alcohol level, it'd be 0.17. This was like the normal number we'd see in the emergency room. People still felt like they could operate a vehicle at 0.17. So let's go ahead and do 0.17 right here. Okay, anytime you're ready, go ahead and begin. Nice, hands at your side, please. Yeah. <laughs> nice, good. <laughs> Great. Yeah, you do got it, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Looks like you got a dance going on right there. Go ahead and turn around, come on back. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's good, that's a good start. <laughs> good, young man, look up at me while you're walking, please. Good, <laughs> high five right there. <laughs> good, good, give him a round of applause right there. Crazy, huh? Good. Yeah, yeah, thanks, man, go ahead and have a seat, you okay? Yeah. yeah. Let me get a female, I need a female volunteer up here real quick, female. Young lady, you wanna come on up? Good, go ahead and give her a round of applause as you make your way up here. Okay. Good. What's your name? Lexi, good. Well, thanks for volunteering, Lexi. Lexi, we're going to have you do the same exact thing, okay? Hands at your side, heel, toe, heel, toe, all the way to the end over there, and then come right back. No, make sure your heel touches your toe. So just like this right here, so your heel's got to touch your toe. So go ahead and hands at your side. Good job. Nice. <laughs> it's always tough when people are watching. I don't know why. Good. Now you're doing great. And turn around, come right back. Good job. Nice. <laughs> Look up at me while you're walking. Good. Good job. Round of applause right there for Lexi. <laughs> Sorry, Lexi, we're going to do the same thing with her, but this time it's going to be nighttime, okay? This is nighttime, 0.17, twice the intoxicated limit. How many beers in two hours? Five. Five. Okay, here we go. I'm just going to put these on you. And right there. Nice. Go ahead and, yeah. You're losing your feet, huh? You got a dance going on. <laughs> She's at the cumbia stage. <laughs> Good. Yeah, that'll help. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. You got, no, no, you got to walk it, yeah. <laughs> but you're doing a good act out. That's pretty much how it goes, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't do this on stage up there. That would have been bad. <laughs> Turn around, come on back. Yeah, good. Look up at me while you're walking. Okay. Again, yeah. <laughs> yeah. High five right here. <laughs> good. Give Lexi a round of applause. Crazy, huh? People still feel like they can operate a vehicle. They still feel like they can do stuff. Do you play any sports or anything? I do. What do you play? I play football, lacrosse, and I'm also on the swim team. Wow. Yeah. Do you think you can play lacrosse with those on? No. No, not at all, right? Yeah. My son tries to play Fortnite and stuff like that with those on. And yeah, it's just crazy. Yeah, or video games and just going all over the place. Last part of the brain, once somebody drinks so much that it starts to affect the last, the back part of their brain or it overtakes the brain, this is where people pass out. This is where it starts to get really dangerous because like I said, once somebody passes out from alcohol, they're not falling asleep. What's happening is their brain is shutting off systems to keep alcohol from coming in.
Somebody falls asleep or from alcohol and they have to pee or puke, they will wake up. Somebody passes out from alcohol, uh, they will not wake up if they have to pee or puke. When I worked at an emergency room, uh, they used to send me out just to talk about this one thing right here, just this one thing. Let's say we're all at a party and we're drinking really hard. Okay, I'm the, I'm the guy that's drinking really hard. And I drink so hard that I pass out. There's two ways I'm gonna pass out. I'm either gonna fall forward or I'm going to fall backwards. Now I may fall to my side, but because of the way my body's designed, more than likely I'm gonna roll onto my back. If I'm laying on my back and my body decides to puke, am I gonna be okay? No, why not? Right, because what goes up? Must come down, right? Yeah. What about if I'm laying face down like this? Am I going to be okay now? No. What's going to happen now? <laughs> right? I'm going to suck that back in, right? And I'm going to die that way. How should I be laying? Side. On your side, correct. If any of you are ever to party and you see somebody pass out because of alcohol, there's three things you need to immediately do. And I wish high school students understood this because this happens. People dying or terrible things happening to people passing out from alcohol happen so often they don't even report it in the news anymore unless it's an extreme case. So there's a case right now. A girl passed out at a party. Two boys said, don't worry, we'll get her home. These two boys started to drag her back to her house, but halfway to her house, they said, we don't want to do this anymore. So they sat her down underneath this big, huge light up against the store. And this was right around one o'clock in the morning. And so the two boys went back to the party. I don't know if any of you heard about this case that's going on in the news right now. And so they leaned this girl up against the door. The two boys went back to the party right around 1.20 or so. There was an emergency call. Four guys jumped into this big, huge fire truck. Two guys jumped into a pickup truck right behind this fire truck. They cranked open this huge door and they took off. When they took off, they didn't realize that this was the door that they had leaned the girl against. So when the door went up, the girl fell backwards being run over by this fire truck. It's terrible what happens when people pass out. Three things I want you to remember, okay? If you're ever at a party, you see somebody pass out, three things you need to do. Number one, first thing you need to do is you need to put them on their side. Put their hand underneath their head like this. Uh, make sure their back is up against the wall. Put a pillow here so they can't roll forward or roll backwards. Number two is you need to call 911. Once somebody passes out from alcohol, they're in a real dangerous place in their life and they need medical assistance. If there's a whole bunch of kids at a party under the age of 21 and they're all drinking and somebody yells, we're going to call 911, what are all their friends going to say? No, don't, right? Yeah. You have to understand it's better to get in trouble for drinking than it is having a dead person at your house. And now let me ask you this for all the kids in the room. If you're in trouble and all your friends are drinking, you think they're going to help you or are they going to make fun of you? Make fun of you, without a doubt. You know how I know? because as an audience, we did it just a second ago. When I brought my two volunteers to walk this line without the goggles on, as an audience, what did we do when they were not wearing the goggles? What did we do? Clap. We didn't clap. Just we just watched, that's it. We sat there quietly and we just watched. But as soon as we put the goggles on, what did we do then? laughed, right? You have to understand that. I've seen this happen so many times where kids are at a party, they're in trouble, and all their friends are doing is making fun of them. Last thing, 12 to 15. 12 to 15. Everybody say those numbers with me. 12 to 15. They need to be breathing 12 to 15 times a minute to know that they're going to be okay. For kids in the room, average age where kids try alcohol for the very first time is age 11 and a half. 11 and a half is where kids try alcohol for the very first time. If somebody starts drinking alcohol, if a kid, a student starts drinking alcohol, 17, 18, 19 years old, for them to become a full-blown alcoholic, this is where alcohol takes over their life, all it takes is a matter of one, two, three, four, five months. That's it. Five months of occasional drinking. Now that you know, wait till you're 21. On your 21st birthday, you're going to go someplace, you're going to drink everything they put in front of you, and you want to become an alcoholic, it's now going to take you about five and a half years. The younger you are when you start doing drugs, the quicker you become addicted to it. You guys, my name's Ray Lozano. I'm going to bring my daughter Brooke up here. Give her a round of applause as she makes her way up here real quick. My daughter travels around with me all across the United States and stuff. She has become the e-cigarette vaping professional. And so let me go ahead and put that right here. 
That's right. That's okay. We'll take a few more minutes. We're going to take about 15 more minutes. Is that okay? Because I want to make sure we cover some vaping information. We'll be okay on time. Yeah, we'll race over there. So. Yeah, okay. I know we're close to it, but I want to make sure you guys got this information. Good. Okay. Good. I'll go up top and see if I can get that. How's everyone doing tonight? Good. Good, good. Okay, so has everybody in here heard of e-cigarettes? Okay, so there's a lot of common misconceptions about e-cigarettes. Uh, has everybody in here heard that they're not as bad for you as regular cigarettes? And has everybody heard that there's no nicotine in e-cigarettes or that it's just water vapor? So we're gonna talk about some of those common misconceptions. So the thing about e-cigarettes is most companies that produce e-cigarette, uh, the liquid that goes into it, say that there's no nicotine in e-cigarettes, but the reality of it is there's actually, there tends to be more nicotine in an average e-cigarette than there is in a regular cigarette. They did the study where they tested e-cigarette uh, vape juices that said they had no nicotine, and what they found is that 95% of them that said they had no nicotine actually did contain large amounts of nicotine. Um, so, Everybody knows that nicotine is the stuff in cigarettes that gets you addicted, right? Well, there's somewhere else you can find nicotine. If I were to ask you guys to go home, find something with nicotine, and bring it back, where could you guys find something in your house with nicotine, not in the form of a tobacco product? So not in a cigarette, not in a vape, not in a patch, or nicotine gum. Where else in your house do you think you could find nicotine? Any ideas? Any thoughts? <laughs> what was that? Pesticide. Bingo! In bug spray. So you could find nicotine in bug spray. Now the reason they put nicotine in bug spray is because what nicotine is, is it's a super, super deadly poison. If you were to take one pack of cigarettes and extract all the nicotine out, you would have about one drop. Just one drop. If you were to put that one drop on your hands, on your tongue, anywhere on your body, that one drop of nicotine would be enough to completely kill you. So that's how deadly a poison nicotine is. Now the way that nicotine is addictive, or the way that nicotine kills things, is it cuts up all the connections in the body. So has everybody in here sprayed a bug with bug spray? And how fast did they die? Really fast, right? So what happens is like right now my arms are communicating with my legs, my legs are communicating with my heart, my heart's communicating with my lungs, and it's all working together to keep me alive. So what happens when you spray a bug with bug spray is it cuts up all those connections in the body so the body parts can't talk to each other anymore and the bug dies. What happens when you add just a tiny, tiny amount of nicotine, like the amount in a cigarette, is it cuts this really important connection in the brain. So let me show you guys where this connection is. Everybody, if you take your index finger and place it right in the center of your forehead, right in the center of your forehead, if you were to go about a knuckle deep, you would hit something called a go button. That's not the technical term, but that's what we're gonna call it, go button. Now if you moved it over to right above your left eye, right above your left eye, you would hit something called a stop button. Okay, go button, stop button, go button, stop button. Now let me show you guys what this go button and stop button does. Um, has everybody in here ever gotten like really, really scared? Like your sibling or your kid or your parent or someone just jumped out and really scared you good? Where are my screamers at? Who screams when they get scared? <laughs> Mostly ladies, a few guys, that's okay. Where are my runners at? Who runs when they get scared? Anybody a runner? <laughs> and last but not least, where are my punchers at? Anybody punch what scares them? <laughs> Well, I have an older brother, and when I was little, I used to love to scare my older brother. And guess which one of the three he was? He was a puncher. And so every now and then I would hide somewhere, and I would jump out, and I would scare my older brother, and my brother would punch me. And so like the little sister that I am, I would run to my mom like, Mom, Mom, he hit me, he hit me. And my mom would get mad at my brother, which I always thought was pretty funny. And so I would scare my brother, he would hit me, I would tell my mom, she would get mad at him. And so I kept doing it and doing it, and one day my mom got so sick of it, she went up to my brother and she said, if you punch your little sister one more time, I'm taking away your Xbox, your computer, I'm taking away your PlayStation, I'm taking away everything. And so I thought, wow, my brother's gonna get all these consequences because of my actions. 
bonus. And so I decide I'm gonna scare him again. <laughs> and so I decide one last one, one really good one to get my brother. So what I do is late at night, I sneak into his room and I go in the closet and I crouch down behind some blankets and I'm hiding there and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm hiding and I'm hiding and I see him wake up and he comes over to the closet to get an outfit and he opens up the door and I rah, scare my brother. And so my brother, pulls back to punch and it turns into like a slow motion movie. You know like those slow motion scenes in like The Matrix or the Fast and the Furious movies and so he's like watching his fist go down and then he's like, ah, I still wanna play my Xbox and he stops himself. Now what happened in my brother's brain was when I scared him, his brain sent a signal to the go button to punch and he pulled back to punch. Then when he decided he didn't want to, the the go button instantly sent a signal to the stop button and he stopped himself. So what happens when you add just a tiny, tiny amount of nicotine is it cuts that connection between the go button and the stop button. That's what makes it really, really easy for somebody to start smoking cigarettes or to start vaping and really, really difficult for them to stop. That's why nicotine is so addictive. So the problem with e-cigarettes is there tends to be more nicotine in them than traditional cigarettes. There's also a bunch of other chemicals. One of the things that people say is that uh, vape juice is just water vapor. But the reality of it is somebody who's vaping does not know what's in that vape juice because the tobacco industries do not have to tell them. One big chemical that they find in almost every single vape juice is FDA approved, so a lot of people think it's okay. It's this uh, chemical that's also in microwave popcorn. And so what happens is when it's in microwave popcorn, people eat it and it's safe. That's why it's approved by the FDA. But when you take that chemical and heat it up really hot and breathe it in, it's completely different and it does a lot of damage to the lungs. They're seeing a huge rise in people going to the hospital with this condition they're calling popcorn lung. It's a super weird name, but it's called popcorn lung. And what it is, is that chemical goes down and it does a lot of scarring to the lungs. Now, has anybody in here heard of vapes exploding? <coughs> the reason why that happens sometimes is what a vape looks like on the inside, and I wish I could draw a picture, but our screen got messed up. But a vape has this liquid and then it passes over a battery. Now the battery, sometimes this liquid can contain little pieces of metal and sometimes other pieces of metal from in the vape will break off and this battery just gets stuck on. And so the battery will just get hotter and hotter and hotter and then it explodes. That's why sometimes you hear about vapes exploding. Now the last piece of the vape cartridge is a coil that gets really hot to turn the liquid into vapor. Now the problem with this is the vapor that comes out is so hot that when it goes down into the lungs, it actually cooks the inner lining of the lungs a little bit. It's super gross, but they're seeing a big rise in people going to the hospital where the inner lining of their lungs have actually cooked a little bit. The other problem is because of how hot the vapor is, it adds a lot of heat and moisture to the lungs. So let me ask you guys, has anybody in here ever taken a really hot shower on a cold day? Who's taken that like quick hot shower where you're like in and out super quick? And what happens to the mirror? It gets all foggy, right? Now, has anybody ever taken that like three hour long hot shower where you like become one with the water and you can't get out and you start like just kind of spinning in the shower and you turn into like a hot dog at a gas station just spinning and spinning and spinning and like you can't get out and your dad's banging on the door you're like, get out of there, you're wasting water and you're like, I can't dad. Who's taken that kind of shower? <laughs> and what happens to the whole bathroom? It gets foggy, right? And the walls are like dripping with liquid and everything's smoky and steamy. Well, that's the same thing that happens in somebody's lungs when they vape. Now, if I were to take a piece of toilet paper, or a piece of tissue paper, and throw it against a dry mirror, what would happen? It would just fall off. Now, if I were to take that piece of toilet paper and throw it against a mirror after I took that super, super long hot shower, then what would happen? 
it would stick. That's the same thing that happens in some of these lungs. Because of how much heat and moisture they've added, all the chemicals from that liquid have a really easy time sticking to the lining of the lungs and entering the body. So it's really easy for these chemicals to be absorbed because of this vape. Now, there were some people who thought that if they made vapor that came out at a cooler temperature, it wouldn't be as bad for you. So they made vapor that, uh, or they made vapes, cartridges, that the vapor came out cooler. And what they found is that because it was cooler than the temperature of their lungs, when it went into the lungs, it turned back into liquid. So they ended up with liquid in their lungs. So they decided that definitely wasn't a good idea. But you can still find vapes that are cooler, but they're even worse. Now the last thing that I want to talk about is how many people a year die from uh, tobacco products. So every year in the United States, 480,000 people will die from tobacco products. I'll work that number down for you guys a little bit. What that works out to is about 1,300 every day or about 54 people every hour. So that's almost one person per minute. Every minute, almost one person is dying from tobacco products. So what the tobacco industry has figured out is that they have 480,000 people a year dying from their products. That's 480,000 people that aren't buying their products anymore. So what they need to do is get 500,000 new people addicted to their products in order to keep making money. That's why uh, when you guys see commercials for vape and when you, or for vapes, and you see it advertised, most of the time it's advertised towards young people. They know that young people aren't smoking traditional cigarettes anymore, so they're trying to get them hooked with vaping. So vaping, jewels, e-cigarettes, all that stuff is the same thing, and it's all marketed towards kids so that they can get them addicted. So vapes are just as bad as traditional cigarettes. How many cigarettes do you think it takes for a kid to become addicted to Smoking, just regular cigarettes. How many cigarettes do you think it takes? Not one, Two. three. All it takes is three cigarettes for a kid to become addicted. So if a kid smokes one cigarette on Thursday, they smoke another cigarette on Saturday, and they smoke one on Monday, that has formed an addiction inside their brain because of how it hits that go button. They're finding out with vapes, it happens like three sessions. Mm -hmm. And if a kid, if you know a kid that is smoking in a classroom, I don't know if you've heard of this or not, where they're taking the jewels, and they're actually smoking in class and they're getting away with it, once a kid gets to the place where they're smoking in a classroom like that, that is a solid indicator that they've developed an addiction inside their system because they're willing to do something despite the consequences of getting in trouble. When it comes to marijuana, marijuana happens and addiction happens real fast for kids. Like I said, alcohol, all it takes is about five months. You guys, my name is Ray Lozano. This is my amazing daughter, Brooke. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you guys tonight. Um,